This week, as stages are set for the upcoming inauguration, activists across the country prepare to strike, block, march, and disrupt. We'll outline what's happening here in D.C., where you can find out about what's happening where you are, and most importantly, the context of these actions for newcomers and seasoned activists alike. Finally, Samantha Castro dishes on her years of activism experience from collaborative efforts across the globe to the importance of creative thinking on the front lines. Hers is the kind of insight and inspiration we need for Friday and all the days past it. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. Well, as much as we'd all like to pretend that it's not happening, this Friday our country will crown the ignominious rise of apathy and neoliberalism and neo-fascism by handing Donald Trump the keys to the country. Take a good hard look, everyone. Don't turn away. This is reality. This is what we have wrought. And for those of you quizzically questioning my inclusion of neoliberalism in that trifecta of disaster, keep in mind that Trump was made possible by neoliberals like these and their policies. Catastrophes don't happen in a vacuum, folks, and neither did Trump. Hence why apathy also deserves a solid mention. And that's why I don't just want to tell you about the planned events that are taking place this week in DC. I want to place them in a necessary context for noobs and seasoned activists alike. J20 and the path ahead are on the front lines this week. So as is the case with any large-scale protest, there has been a fuck-ton of planning leading up to this week. This past weekend, a coalition of student groups and community organizations hosted an MLK action camp that offered training in nonviolent direct action, knowing your rights, street safety, de-escalation tactics, community and workplace organizing, and more. Today, climate groups and activists are coming together for a climate convergence in order to discuss climate strategy under Trump, as well as tactics for Friday. Tomorrow, nonviolent direct action trainings will continue, and in the afternoon, activists will descend upon the DNC in order to make it clear that, quote, it is the neoliberal and militaristic policies of the Democrats that paved the way for a Trump presidency. And tomorrow, in the evening, the D.C. Anti-Fascist Coalition will organize a protest at the National Press Club where white supremacist, white supremacist assbags, who like to call themselves the alt-right, will be holding an event called the Deplorable. No, really, they named it that themselves. These are the times we're living in, folks. So anyone who ever wanted to crash a fancy party and not feel guilty about it afterwards, this would be a good time for that. And then, of course, there's Friday, and that's when it all goes down. Starting before sunrise, some groups as early as 4.30 a.m., activists will take to the streets in order to form various blockades organized around specific issues and communities, such as climate, racial justice, trade justice, economic justice, communities under attack, labor, LGBTQ, anti-war in Palestine, and so on. As per usual with affinity groups, each group will decide how it wants to hold the space around their checkpoint, whether or not they'd like to risk arrest, what goals and messages they would like to promote, and how they'd like to promote them. We'll of course be on the streets <clears throat> for these actions, and I myself will be participating and helping to organize the anti-war contingency for a couple of hours before heading over to Trade Justice. For details on the ground, remember to follow us on Twitter at ActOutOnOccupy. Around 10 a.m., the inaugural parade will start, and again, groups can choose how long they'd like to hold their respective spaces. For those interested, at 10 a.m., an anti-capitalist and anti-fascist bloc will meet in Logan Circle for an action. Details forthcoming, but as is customary, wear black if you can. 
At 12, there will be a permitted march from Columbus Circle to McPherson Square, the Festival of Resistance March and Rally. McPherson Square will act as a hub of sorts for activists and will be up and running between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And for those of you watching this thinking, ah, oh, fuck, I wish I could go, but I just can't make it all the way to D.C., Fret not, for there may be something already planned in your area. If you head over to the Disrupt J20 site at disruptj20.org, you can find a whole list of actions being planned across the country. And guess what? If there isn't one, you can organize one yourself. The site offers tools and support for those wanting to dive in locally. Also something to keep in mind is the National Strike. Activists across the country are calling on everyone to stand in solidarity with people and planet. To be, for that day, ungovernable. As stated on the event page, no, we cannot vote this establishment away. Our politics must escape the voting booth. We need a change of system, not change within the system. And we need it now. But if we cannot rely on the elections for the change we need, what are we to do? We must combat the establishment using a different weapon. That weapon is the general strike. The logic of the general strike is simple. On January 20th, 2017, each and every one of us refuses to comply with whatever orders that the economic establishment has given to us. We walk out of our homes, our places of work, and our schools, and we join our fellow citizens in the streets and online in a peaceful display of resistance and solidarity. In this way, we defy the establishment. And this thinking brings me to my next point. How to effectively stand up to this rise of neo-fascist, white supremacist, woman-hating, crooked, bigoted bullshit. In short, don't ask for permission. And don't ask, period. Demand. The difference between the two is, of course, that one has consequences, like, for example, a general strike. Demanding places us in power, asking acknowledges theirs. And asking the corrupt to be less corrupt will always be a losing battle. We are in this shit right now. Again, take a good, hard look. We can't petition that away or ask nicely for our freedom. This appealing style of activism is like trying to treat cancer with band-aids. Your heart might be in the right place, but your head is way the fuck off. We have to demand justice, demand peace, demand freedom, and we have to take it. We have to be a colossal pain in the ass. We have to be, again, ungovernable. We have to stand together, and when they say jump, we say, fuck you. And this is not about advocating violence. This is about advocating dissent. And it is far past time that we stopped manufacturing consent and started manufacturing dissent by the truckload, and ship that shit out like Christmas packages from sea to shining sea and back again. And that is what the protests this week need to be about. They are not and cannot be about stopping Trump from being inaugurated. Indeed, it can't even just be about Trump because that train left the give a shit station a long time ago. Disrupt J20 needs to be about a promise, an oath, a pledge, an affirmation to be ungovernable, to rise up and stand strong, to be unwavering in our fight for justice, and to recognize people and planet over profit as non-negotiable tenants of any decision, to recognize the system as a whole being what's wrong, not just one guy at the top. And to all of my seasoned activists watching this thinking, well, yeah, you're just preaching to the choir. Yes, good, and keep on singing. But now part of our job as seasoned activists must be to make sure that those taking to the streets for the first time are greeted warmly and openly as we bring them in to the real work, the real long-term fight. Use this mind-blowingly fucked election to your advantage. As Kilu Nyasha, artist, activist, and former Black Panther put it, frankly, I'm relieved that Trump won instead of Clinton. Had she won, folks would be singing Kumbaya and celebrating the first woman president of the United States. We could have looked at another four to eight years of a warmongering Clinton administration with our people pacified like they were behind the first black president. Trump's election prompted mass demonstrations immediately all across the country. Students are walking out of class, coalitions are being formed, and plans made for a huge mass protest on January 20th in DC. We must all unite and organize, organize, organize. Dare to struggle, 
dare to win. Fuck yes. And again, seasoned activists, this means that you can't be an asshole to the newbies that you meet out there. Enough with this, well, where were you five years ago? Shut up, who gives a shit? They're here now. You too woke up later than some. And how would you have reacted to the activist community had you been greeted by some ass ex complaining that you weren't there sooner? Probably not all that great. Point your frustrations the right way. Literally. And for those just joining the fight for the first time, welcome to the front lines. And if you thought that you could come for one then done, understand that the best is yet to come. Don't let this be a reactionary one-off. You deserve better. And so do all the reasons that brought you out in the first place. Understand that this is a lifetime of fight. And that may sound daunting, but as I've said before, there is nothing more rewarding and indeed so often fun and uplifting as activism. It is the knowledge that we can be better, that we can do better, and it is the act of making that happen. It is personal evolution in order to promote social evolution. It is life engaged, engaged in both beauty and horror of reality, the full spectrum. It is a life lived full. So again, welcome to the newcomers, fight on to my fellow old schoolers, and for the fight ahead, let's use J20 and indeed the Women's March the following day as a jumping off point. A loud, a beautiful, a creative and cohesive primal scream of that pledge, that promise to keep fighting, to keep coming back, to keep dissenting, and to keep being ungovernable. All is one for people, for planet, on the front lines. Hope you're feeling jacked up like I am. Again, for more information on the actions happening on the 20th, visit disruptj20.org. Also on the site, you'll find a great legal page that outlines what you should expect and what your rights are while protesting. One of my personal favorites that is so often missed is the point that your interaction with cops on the street will not be the way it looks like in an episode of Law & Order. A lot of times, they won't explain your rights at all, or not until much later. They'll just try to make conversation, say something like, yeah, you know, I'm not a big fan of Trump either. And before you know it, your mouth is off and running and not realizing that all of this can and probably will still be used against you even if that cop hasn't made clear your rights. Best thing to do, remain silent. And if they ask you anything, refuse to answer without legal counsel. Even if you like the idea of cops, they're not your friends in these situations. So, some solid tidbits like that and more on the aforementioned legal page on the Disrupt J20 site. I can also very much recommend following them on Twitter at Disrupt J20. Not only do they have continuously updated info about nationwide actions, but they have some brilliant rebuttals to would-be trolls. And I know that I'm personally always on the lookout for some eloquent comebacks. Now, while I haven't talked much about the Women's March on the 21st, that is of course also a huge event that although being a punching bag for some leftist infighting, has come together powerfully, particularly in this past week. It started off on some shaky ground, with some objecting to the initial title of the march poaching the 1997 Million Woman March, a march organized in Philly to highlight black power, solidarity, and the fight for freedom. Besides bringing in a larger coalition of women from various backgrounds, late last week, the Women's March on Washington released a progressive platform that moves far beyond the original vague, yay, women paradigm. Included in the platform were overt mentions of support for Black Lives Matter, the Occupy Movement, American Indian Movement, unions, and the movements for sex, wor sex workers, farm workers, and domestic workers. The four-page statement also highlighted specific policy points, such as, quote, increased accountability for perpetrators of police brutality and racial profiling, demanding the demilitarization of American law enforcement and an end to mass incarceration. Comprehensive anti-discrimination protections, health care, and gender-affirming identity documents for LGBTQ people. The rejection of mass deportation, family detention, violations of due process, and violence against queer and trans migrants, among other issues. 
The release of this statement late last week was certainly a welcome and indeed necessary addition to a march that could easily go the way of the massive People's Climate March in New York a few years ago, where hundreds of thousands of people joined together to um, walk down the street and then eventually go home because uh, climate, I guess? Hopefully now, the Women's March has the necessary teeth to move from a one-off permitted march to a catalyst for more engagement, new connections, and continued work. Again, as long as we all understand the context and don't leave the march thinking, wow, fix that problem, feminism for the win. Indeed, any action must be regarded as a point on a long timeline of various tactics and targets. So props to the organizers for making their progressive platform clear, and to anyone watching, if participating in an event like this is your gateway drug, inhale deeply. For more info on the Women's March, check out womensmarch.com. Here again, you'll find ways to connect with actions happening in your area. And now, before we wrap up this week, I'd like to bring in a seasoned activist to talk about tactics, targets, collaboration, and the importance of art in the fight for people and planet. Samantha Castro is the co-founder of the Whistleblowers, Activists, and Citizens Alliance, or WACA, based in Australia. From across the globe, she pinpoints some powerful ideas and issues that are so distinctly paralleled here. From leftist infighting to the use of privilege, her perspective and experience is not only insightful, but serves as precisely that brand of inspiration from seasoned activists necessary for the road ahead. Take a look. We're very interested in tying together the relationship between what we call the perfect storm, um, which is corporations, military, media, and the impact that has around climate change. Uh, so that's kind of our focus. And we look for very targeted campaigns where we can actually try and make a difference. So for example, at the moment in Australia, you may have heard our government is a, uh, a refugee policy pariah of the world. Uh, we are illegally detaining people in offshore gulags. Uh, so the way that WACA is attempting to deal with that situation when both sides of politics in our country support it is to disrupt business as usual and to take down the industrial detention model by going after the very people that are profiteering from it. So our campaign to close the camps has been very, very focused on picking out the corporations, the private corporations that are being hired with commercial incompetence by our government uh, to basically abuse refugees and to act as the Gestapo in these offshore camps. So the headline on on the WACA site reads that our leader, our leaders refuse to act. When our leaders refuse to act, the community must step forward. Um, so at this point, seeing where we're at, you know, you mentioned what's happening in Australia. Obviously, unfortunately, what's happening here. Uh, but even with Obama, he did not have one day of peace, and in his entire presidency, an average of twenty bombs were dropped, um, or a, an average of a bomb every twenty minutes was dropped for eight years solid. Uh, so when we talk about this, the community must step forward. Do you feel that we've failed as communities? Do we need to change our tactics moving forward? And how how does this tie into like when leaders fail? Like, should we just assume that they're already failing, or should we still interconnect with them? You know, I think that was something that was very obvious to anyone in Paris is that our leaders have already failed. Having said that, I also think that to some respect. Um, the institutionalized structure of movement has also failed. Uh, if we had been successful, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in both uh, economically, politically and environmentally. So I really do think we have to reassess how we organize. And I really do believe that the community needs to stop asking permission and step forward and intervene in particular scenarios. I think that the way that we've organised has replicated the same structural issues, though, that we have in our political institutions and our corporate institutions. And by that I mean we have worked as movement, whether you're defending human rights or the environment or trying to influence politics, in a very similar, similarly structured way, which is a very hierarchical uh, process where NGOs 
get the money, hire campaigns, and then tell the people what to do. Uh, WACA works in a very different way, and anyone that has been using this model, which there are not that many, in Australia at least, has been highly successful in influencing outcomes both in terms of policy and behaviour. Uh, so we believe in really flat, structured, complex, co what we call complex theory organising, uh, which is enabling people to come together in their local areas and control the grassroots campaign and how it unfolds in their area uh, with dispersed leadership, I guess. So we're looking at a much more flat structured model which enables communities to adopt the issue to their particular area and scenario uh, without needing a CEO and an NGO to tell them what to do. So self-autonomous organising has two things that it, it must have for it to succeed, in my opinion, and that is common objective and common value. Uh, and that's really all that you need. You don't need to tell people how to do things. Providing them with skill and sharing is essential, uh, but then trying to control campaigns, I think, is what has led to, you know, really um, the reduction of movement to symbolic gesture. Um, talk about the creative aspect of these actions and why it's important to infuse activism with art. I believe that every direct action that, that we do should be, the direct action should be the message. So the visual is just as important as the action that you're taking and when you get it right, the two come together perfectly. In the late capitalist era, it seems that artists are reluctant to really engage in, in politics unless it serves to promote their Instagram or their personality or their product. I feel like artists in a lot of ways are restricted in, in how political they can be in their work if they want to actually be able to pay their rent and survive from it. Uh, so activism offers artists a way to continue to express themselves and it offers uh, a much needed tool to activism, which is creativity. Uh, we can't solve the problems that these monolithic patriarchal structures have created by replicating them. And so we do need creative thinkers. So I encourage all artists to get political again. And I think it's really important that activist group let those creative people explore and distill their ideas. So, for example, we uh, did a direct action once where we decided to shut down an Israeli arms manufacturer called Albert Systems. Uh, so we decided what we wanted to do was to drop a massive banner off their um, factory and build them a fake Israeli separation wall and put some beautifully cut shadows of Palestinians with targets on them across the bottom of the wall uh, with a sign that said, uh, Albert Systems Battlefield Tests on Palestinian Children. Now, to get to that idea, to get to, to distill that three-layered image that went all over the world, including into Palestine, uh, we needed creative people to feel free enough to explore the idea. So I think the first suggestion that came from one of our artists who works with us was, let's dress up as Muslims. <laughs> And it was like, uh, I don't, we don't think that's going to work, but keep going with that idea. So not, not knocking people down in the era of identity, politic and political correctness and going, how dare you suggest that? What a racist idea. But actually going, well, hang on a minute. Maybe there's something in, the, in this. Let's play with this idea. Let's allow people to be creative without feeling like they're going to be criticised for their politics. And also it was effective. We managed to get uh, a government contract with Albert Systems cancelled out of that process and we continue to work on getting that company out of Australia altogether. Uh, so looking for ways where art and activism inter intersect in direct action and are actually effective, so are not just symbolic. They are either disrupting business, costing the corporation money, or higher, higher exposure of really bad behavior. What do you feel uh, are, the, are the big fights ahead? And what would you say to people 
um, even activists that are just starting out, what would you say to, to focus on? The left has, in that really institutionalized, monolithic way, has become really arrogant and gatekeeping in the way that it enables people to engage. So as I touched on before, if you if you say one wrong word in the identity politics scheme, you're shunned out of a group or out of the movement for being a racist or a homophobe or a transphobic or, you know, rather than people being open to dialogue and education and understanding that not everyone has had the same opportunities to get themselves to a critical point of thinking. And actually, isn't that what we've been wanting to do all along, is to bring in those people that are not us and let them have a voice within the movement? So I, in some ways I feel like there is a uh, a bubble attitude that has gone on with, with the people on the left that hold the credential voice uh, that is sprinkled down into all of the groups uh, and it, it scares people away from movement. They don't feel that they can come in. They don't feel that they have any ownership. Uh, and they certainly don't feel that the people on the left take them seriously if they mispronounce words, etc. So there is a need for the grassroots to truly become grassroots. And that requires the educated left stepping over themselves and remembering what we're trying to achieve. And that has to include embracing people that don't have the same ideas as us. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is to make your work so about the local uh, achievement of an objective that it brings everyone together. Um, a very wise old activist said to me a few years ago, if you really want to be rebellious, why don't you try unity? For more on Samantha's incredible activist work, check out waka.net.au. And that, revolutionaries, does it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Keep in mind that next week we'll be airing a special from the streets of D.C., so in the meantime, please spread and share this episode with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide as usual to see all the sites and links mentioned in this week's show, and be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit Patreon.com slash Act Out.